Well, hello, Stacy Murphy here, and in this video, you're going to discover plant biology of your vegetables and herbs so you can grow a garden that thrives. Because here's the deal. When you first start growing vegetables and herbs, plants are living, breathing things. You're creating a relationship with these things. And it's kind of like going out on a first date and getting to know your plants. And it's all about understanding the language that they're speaking so that you can know where they're coming from and know what they need. It's kind of like dating. So I'm going to walk you through plant biology so that your garden can thrive. And there's two main reasons why this is so important. So you can avoid most pest and disease issues if you understand basic plant science. And I'm just going to give you one quick example of that so you understand why this is so important. So over here I have my African blue basil, which is this beautiful bush, tons of honeybees all over it right now. And we always think of our plants as solid things. You know, here's this leaf. And we think of this as like, this is a solid thing. But in reality, this is very much like our skin. It's porous. And there's openings that are actually here on a microscopic level. So I'm not talking about the veins that deliver water and nutrients. I'm talking about on the surface of this leaf are something called stomata. And those are openings that open and close throughout the day. And this is how photosynthesis works. These openings open up and it allows sunlight in and carbon dioxide in, and it, that's, that's what transforms everything into sugar and oxygen for us later. So these leaves, those openings that are on the leaves, those are also places where pathogens can enter. And so by knowing that your leaves are going to, the stomata on your leaves are going to be open the most during the peak sunlight of the day, here's a little a tip at the start of this video to avoid pests and or to avoid diseases in particular those openings are open those are places where pathogens and diseases can enter so if you're watering your plants midday and you're watering the leaves that's a place where now you have a place where bacterial and fungal infections can enter your plants. So you don't want to be watering your plants midday when the stomata is wide open, soaking up the sun ray. All right, so this is one reason why knowing plant biology is so important because it'll help you keep healthier plants. All right, so that's one reason why it's really important to understand plant biology. And I'm going to be talking about more science throughout this video. I'm going to make it really fun. And the second reason is that you can increase the yield of your garden how much harvest that you get, you can increase it significantly when you understand plant biology because this is one of the mistakes I see beginners make all the time. We're going to talk about this later on in the video. Uh, there's a way to know when a plant is done producing. It's just done. It's not going to give you any more food. And that's the moment to pull it out and plant something else. But what I see beginners do is they hope and pray that somehow this plant is going to give them more food and it's just a waste of space. So the two big reasons why you want to pay close attention to this video, I'm going to be giving you tips to understanding your plant biology. And the outcome is that you are communicating directly with your plants. You know what they want. You're going to decrease the pest and disease issues and you're going to increase your yield. All right, so here we go. This is what we're gonna to cover today in this video. So you're gonna discover the five stages of plant growth for typical vegetable and herbs. You're gonna know what to expect in each one of those stages. So you know what your role is as a steward as that plant is growing, all right? And you're gonna keep your plants healthier that way. And then I'm gonna show you five weird things that plants do and what they mean. And then plus you're gonna understand the plant families and that's gonna help you simplify your garden in the long run, all right? So here we go. So the first thing I wanna talk about are the plant families. And we're gonna be talking about our vegetable and herb gardens. And so I'm gonna be sharing with you the typical families of vegetable and herbs. So we're talking about things like the tomato family, the, the carrot family, the cucumber family, the herb family. So everything shown here on this image on the screen. Now here we go into the first weird thing about plants. So when you talk about families of plants that are typically seen in your vegetable and herb garden, you see all your typical vegetables like kale and collards and carrots and onions and potatoes and tomatoes and all of those typical, those typical vegetables. But you also see 
watermelon, and cantaloupe. And what's not listed in these families, but is also grown in a typical vegetable and herb garden are strawberries. So it's kind of weird that we grow strawberries, watermelon, and cantaloupe with our vegetables uh, versus elsewhere. And there's a reason for this. The reason is that they have the same needs as your typical vegetable and herbs. Specifically, the watermelon and cantaloupe plants are in the same family as cucumber and squash. And so they have the same requirements. They like to grow in the same kind of soil. So this is much different than your other uh, fruits, like say apple, and pear, and peach. These all grow on trees. So we're not going to be talking about trees in this presentation. Those require totally different things. And then the other thing that uh, is interesting about about fam plant families is strawberries are kind of a funky one. Strawberries are also grown in a veg vegetable and herb garden, unlike blueberries and blackberries. You can be growing those blueberries and blackberries close by, but typically they grow in a bush and the way that those plants grow is totally different than plants in a vegetable and herb garden. Strawberries actually have more in common with plants in a vegetable and herb garden because they like to be rotated every three years. So they're not perennial like a blueberry bush is or a blackberry bush, and they don't require the same kind of pruning that a blueberry and black blackberry bush do. So that's why they're included in a vegetable and herb garden. So it's kind of weird, but cantaloupe, watermelon, and strawberries are three fruits that are typically included inside of a vegetable and herb garden. And there's one more that's unusual that most people don't think about, but is also one more fruit that is grown in a typical vegetable and herb garden, and that's ground cherries. They're very delicious. They are in the tomato family, and they kind of taste like a mixture of a tomato and a pineapple. All right, so that's a little bit about the families. You have everything on the screen here that shows the different families, and the reason why each family is sectioned out is that they have similar ways of growing. So when you look at a beet plant and a chard plant, they look a lot alike. When you look at a tomato plant and a pepper plant and a tomatillo plant, they have similar growing conditions. When you look at a kale plant and a collard plant, they grow similarly and you harvest them similarly. So this is how the families are linked is that they have similar characteristics, um, but there's also differences. So nature is so biodiverse, there's also some differences. It's a little confusing, I know, but the reason why we group them together into families is to make it a little bit simpler to plan our gardens. And the other thing that families have in common is typically the temperatures at which those vegetables thrive is about the same. So your tomato family and your cucumber family, these are two families that love warmer, warmer temperatures. And then you have your your greens, which are in a lot of the cabbage family, and those, they prefer cooler temperatures, but they can go into the warmer temperatures as well. All right, so that's an introduction to the different plant families in your vegetable and herb garden, and we'll be going into more detail throughout this presentation. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna walk you through the five stages of plant growth, what to expect during each stage of growth, and what your plants need from you in order to thrive. Now the first stage of plant growth is germination and emergence. This is when the seed sprouts out of the soil. And a lot of people when they're growing food call this seed starting, or they call it planting seeds, or they call it sowing seeds. And th that's a whole presentation by itself. So I'm not gonna go into depth into this stage of growth. Um, it, it would take an entire presentation. So the main thing to understand when you're thinking about starting from seed is that there, this is the basic plant science that I want you to understand when you're starting seeds, is that when a seed is underground, it has everything it needs to sprout. All it needs is a dark space and a little bit of water. Some plants like a little bit of sun actually when they germinate, but most vegetable and herbs, they like darkness. They like to be under soil and a little bit of moisture and they'll sprout. And what you'll see is you'll see two little things, green things come up above the soil and you'll think that those are leaves, but they're not. They're called cotyledons and they are actually a part of the seed. Now, why is this important and why am I telling you? So the reason why this is important about plant science is that up until that point, all those, all those seeds need are a little bit of moisture 
to just sprout those little two first little green things, those first two little cotyledons. And here's an image of all these different types of plants and what their cotyledons and first leaves look like. So after those first two cotyledons come out, the next thing that comes out is the first true leaf. The reason this is important is that it's at this moment that the plants are going to need more. They need more fertilization. They need nutrients. Up until this point, all they need is water and darkness. So this is really cool. What this, this is why you can grow pea shoots and you can grow sunflower shoots without much nutrient uh, in the soil because the seed isn't really looking for anything. It has everything already inside of it. But the minute the first true leaf comes out, now the plant is looking for more moisture and more nutrients. And this is weird thing number two in this presentation is that the first things that look like leaves, they aren't. And you'll be really smart when you, when you say to your friends, nope, those aren't leaves, those are called cotyledons. And actually, they're a part of the seed. And the reason it's important is that up until now, the plant doesn't actually need much in the way of nutrition, it just needs water just needs moisture and darkness. All right, and at this point, your plants need light. So this is why it's also important. So if you're growing indoors, you can get to that shoot part, but then once you once you uh, once those those cotyledons come out, your plants need 6 to 8 hours of sunlight minimum. Now there's one more thing about this stage of growth that I want you to understand, and that's that when you're a beginner, what you may not realize is that not all plants are going to make it. Sometimes you think it's your fault because the plant didn't make it, but sometimes it's just the plant isn't going to make it. So on your packets of seeds, it will say germination fail or germination rate. That's the percentage of seeds that under ideal situations are going to germinate. So if it says 90%, that means 9 out of 10 seeds are going to make it. So you want to look at that germination rate and know that some are going to fail. So you want to plant enough seeds in order to get the number of plants you're looking for, but there's one more level to this that I want you to understand, and that's that for every plant that makes it to germination, not all of them are gonna make it in your garden. Most gardens have a 75% uh, success rate, and 25% of plants are gonna fail at some point. And so you can add that failure rate in so that you can work the math backwards and say, if I want this many plants, I know that I'm only going to get nine out of 10 are going to germinate. And out of those nine, only seven of them are going to thrive in my garden. And so now I don't feel bad when a couple of them fail in my garden. So that's the important part of this stage that I want you to understand. All right, let's move on to stage number two. So stage number two is called the vegetative state. This is when the plants start growing their leaves. So this is where the plant is really focused on growing greenery and so that it can photosynthesize and it can thrive. So you want to do everything in your power to grow more greenery first and foremost, especially if you're growing fruiting plants like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers, you want to get enough leaves so that the plant can photosynthesize so that it can produce great fruit for you later down the road. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward here to a plant that is the size of what we call a seedling or a transplant size. This is a teenager plant, and if you're a beginner, this is where I would love for you to start. This is the easiest place to start is with teenage plants. They're already grown for you, uh, and you just pop them in the soil. And so these plants are anywhere between three weeks and 11 weeks, depending on what type of plant they are. So what's important to know about the vegetative state? So what's important is that there are some plants that you want to keep in this stage as long as possible, and then there are others that pass through it into fruiting. So the plants that you want to keep in this state as long as possible are your root vegetables and your greens, things like lettuce, kale, anything that you're going to harvest the greens from because that's the vegetative state. So you want to keep the plants there as long as possible. So I'm going to show you in just a minute what your plants are going to look like when they pass out of the vegetative state so you know what to look for when that happens and why that's important and what to do about it. But for now, I want to share weird thing number three about 
plants that are just, it's just so cool. Uh, so essentially, unlike animal stem cells that can only create new types of cells early in an animal's development, plants are always creating new parts based on the need at the time. And they create this through special tissue called meristem. And so this is really cool. This means that your plant is always producing new infrastructure, new territory for photosynthesis, new health. It's always producing new healthy cells for your plant. It's focused on healthy production. So what does this mean for you? This means that you can get ahead of any plant diseases that you might find with your plants because when you remove the bad tissue, the tissue that is infected, you are allowing the plant space to produce new tissue with this meristem structure. So what this means is that, let's say you have a tomato plant, and my tomatoes, I live on the ocean, we get a lot of fungal diseases here because we're by the ocean, it's very moist and it's very hot air, so we get a lot of fungal diseases. And we can do lots of things to keep that at bay, we can add vermicompost, we can add compost tea, we can add all kinds of different things to help us but one of the other things we can do is we can remove any signs of any fungal diseases off of old growth and the plant's gonna continuously produce new growth that's healthy. And we do this all the time and you can produce, or you can, you can eliminate up to 50% of your plant's greenery without uh, affecting the health of the plant. You're actually benefiting the health of the plant by removing and pruning away what's not working and creating space, more space for what is working. And so this is the way that we stay ahead of a lot of diseases here in this sort of hot, uh, moist air here on the ocean. And the, the only thing to be careful of is that if you're in a really, really hot desert climate, and let's say you remove a lot of the leaves and your fruit of your tomatoes and your peppers are exposed to harsh sunlight, you can get some sun scald. So if that's the case, you do wanna maybe put up some sun protection, a little bit of shade cloth, but for the most part, you can remove a lot of the leaves to stay ahead of disease. And so when your plants look like they have something funky going on, one of the first things that you can do is remove those leaves so that the plant can focus on the health. Don't leave it on the plant assuming that it's gonna get better. Take it off and let the plant adjust. Okay, let's go through the different families of plants in your vegetable and herb garden and what to expect during the vegetative state. Now, it's gonna get a little wonky here because by, nature is so biodiverse and it has so many exceptions to the rules. Um, and so like we like to classify things based on family because family is how plants are scientifically classified and, where, and they have things in common. But now you're gonna see that plants also have commonalities across families. So for instance, let's talk about root vegetables first. You're gonna notice that carrots are in the carrot family but that turnips are in the cabbage family and onions are in the allium family. So you're gonna notice that there, these are three different families, but I'm, I'm grouping them together as root vegetables because they all have something in common in the vegetative state, which is that you essentially, there's one thing you wanna know about root vegetables and that's at the spacing, whatever the spacing is, you, you can look at your seed packet to look at the spacing, you know, for a carrot, it might be one inch apart. For a beet, it might be three or four inches apart. The one thing you wanna know about the vegetative state is once the plant has its first true leaf, you wanna thin it so that the distance apart, they have enough space to grow in. If they're too crowded in the vegetative state, then the, the bulb of the root may not form. And I know the bulb, that root vegetable is gonna form later, but if you don't thin them at an early stage, the bulb may not form. So in the vegetative state, you wanna make sure that you thin them to the spacing that you want for them to grow in. That's one of the most important things is to give them the space they need. And you can, if you see some damage on the leaves from pests like leaf miners, oftentimes will get into beets, you can remove those leaves and the plant will still thrive, the beets will still come in. All right, 
So you're just focused on giving those plants water and nutrients. Um, greens during the vegetative state, you want to keep them in that state as long as possible. We've mentioned that. And there's a couple different types of greens. There are what I, you won't see these classifications anywhere else, but I like to call them stem greens. And stem greens are greens that grow vertically. And you are going to be harvesting off the bottom leaves. As it grows, you're harvesting off the bottom leaves. Those plants start to look like palm trees with a very tall stem and the leaves at the top. Those are what I call stem greens, and they can grow pretty tall. Then there are what I would call mound greens, and they grow in a mound. And these are things like lettuces and spinaches. And these are things where you're still, you can still harvest the outside leaves, but generally they grow low to the ground, they grow in a mound, and if they grow vertically, it's not a good thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, so in the vegetative state for your greens, you're mostly looking at watering them, giving them any kind of nutrition that they need. You may decide that if you didn't add enough fertility to your soil at the beginning of the season, you might add some sort of nitrogen addition. Something like a seaweed fertilizer is, is something that we like to add uh, throughout the season. And then you have plants like your cucumber family. These are plants that love to vine, almost all of them except for summer squash. So you've got your melons and you've got your winter squashes. All of these, they love to grow vertically. And so with cucumbers specifically, you definitely want some sort of trellis to get them up off the ground. And then with your melons and your squashes, a lot of people let them grow horizontally across their lawns if they have space, but you can also allow those to grow vertically as long as we'll talk about fruit in a bit that you give it some sort of support because that fruit's going to be really heavy uh, if it's a watermelon or a, or a cantaloupe or something it's going to be very heavy and could pull your whole trellis down you've got your tomato family plants which some of them this is a distinction in the vegetative state that to understand some of them are determinate and some of them are indeterminate what does that mean you want to know, is your plant going to grow to a certain size and stop growing? Or is it going to vine and grow exponentially for as long as it can until the season changes? And the reason you want to know this is it affects how you prune the plant. So you want to know what that is. And if it's vining, you can do a lot more pruning and the plant's just going to keep on vining. But if it only grows to a certain size, you want to keep your pruning to a minimum so that you get the maximum value out of that plant. All right, so we've talked about root crops already and how they grow during the vegetative state. And we've also talked about stem crops, how they grow vertically along a tall stem and how you pull off lower leaves. We've talked about mound crops where they grow in small clusters close to the ground and you harvest outer leaves. And we've talked about fruiting crops and how they either vine indefinitely or how they grow in small bushes. Let's talk about a couple more types of, of plants and how they grow. So the first type I want to talk about is a doubling crop. And these are plants like basil, peas, sage, callaloo, rosemary, and lavender. And essentially when you cut these crops at what I would call nodes, then basically you increase the yield. And what do I mean by node? It's essentially where the stem grows vertically and there's leaves that are growing off of the stem and then you'll see new growth growing between the main stem and those leaves. And I would call that the node. And when you cut just above that node, you're going to see the plant. In this case, you're gonna see a doubling in the case of basil, where there's two leaves on both sides of the stem and new growth grows on both, both sides. Sometimes the growth happens where the leaves alternate up the stem and there's a single leaf or a single branch coming off and there's a single new uh, set of growth. So that's it doesn't necessarily double, but when you cut it, new growth grows out of that intersection. And then one more type of plant growth is a heading growth. And this is for plants like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower and also things like garlic and onions. These are things where essentially as the plant grows, it forms a head 
And that head is, you just chop off the entire head in order to harvest. And there's a couple of exceptions out there that are not on the main family list. And those are okra and corn. And those plants just grow really, really tall. So corn can grow 10 feet tall. Okra can just, if it if it's hot enough, okra will just keep on growing. I've grown it up to 10 feet tall and I've had to chop it off at the top because it's just too tall to harvest. And so we've been talking mostly about vegetables. Let's talk briefly about herbs. So herbs, there's one more kind of vegetative style with plants to recognize, and that is more of a runner plant. This is something like oregano, mint. Uh, these are plants that will spread all around your garden if you let them. They'll grow roots underground and they'll just keep sprouting up more and more plants. So those are the basic types of vegetation that happens. And I, this video is too short to go into detail in any single one of them, but just so you know, you have an overview now of what to expect and how big these plants get. And the good news is that in the vegetative stage, there's not a lot that you need to do to help keep your garden thriving. You are the steward of the plants. The plants are doing all the work, the sun, the soil. So if you have your soil set up well, there's a lot of fertility. You have your plants in an area where there's six to eight hours of sunlight. You have a watering system set up so that they get one to two inches of water depending on how hot it is and whether there's a lot of evaporation going on. All you really need to do is keep up with the plants, give them support when they need them. If the trellis uh, you know, is holding up the plant away from the soil, that's going to protect the plants from soil-borne diseases. So it's good to get your plants up off the ground if you can. And all you really need to do periodically is you need to check for pests. So once a week getting out looking for any eggs or caterpillar damage and staying ahead of that. And of course harvesting. So if you're, especially with your greens, you wanna be harvesting a couple times a week and that's gonna keep you ahead of any pest issues because it takes a couple days for pest eggs to turn into insects that actually eat your vegetables. And so if you're harvesting several times a week, you're gonna stay ahead of those pest cycles. And you can always add more life into your garden as your plants are in the vegetative state. And so you can create more life and more healthy habitat by adding some more nutrients, some more fertilization through the way of compost. You can also add more compost tea to improve the, the health of the plants as well. But you're not doing a whole lot besides harvesting. Harvesting is really like 40% of what you're gonna be doing once the plants are healthy. All right, so up until now, we've been talking about just the second stage, which is the vegetative stage. Let's move into the reproductive stage, which is stage three of your plant life cycle. And this is otherwise known as fruiting and flowering. This is what we look forward to with all those delicious tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, all of that. That's when fruiting starts to happen. Um, flowering is also a part of this process. So what reproductive development stage means is essentially that the plant is hormonally changing because it's producing seeds for the next generation. And what happens in this stage uh, for your green plants, your kale, your collard, your lettuces, because it hormonally changes the plant, this you may notice a flavor difference if you're harvesting your greens and eating them. I still like them, I think they taste great, but a lot of people think that greens that have gone to flower are a little bit more bitter. I happen to like bitter, so it's good for me. Now, the weird thing, I wanna talk about the fourth weird thing that plants do and what it means. So we talked about in the vegetative state that you want certain plants to stay there as long as possible, your greens and your root vegetables. And the reason why you want them there as long as possible is you want the roots to form as big of root vegetable as possible so you get a big harvest, or you want your greens to keep producing so you get as much harvest as you can. One of the weird things that plants do is, especially with lettuces, so they're little tiny plants. They're like this, you know, like this big. And spinach is like this too. It's like a little tiny mound style plant. And it's a little tiny thing. And then all of a sudden, when it reaches its productive development stage, and different things can trigger this. Heat can trigger this. If, it, if you're growing lettuce and it gets too hot, heat will trigger this. Heat will trigger it for things like carrots. Um, so 
or water. Uh, if you have massive changes in water and it goes through a drought and it doesn't expect it, sometimes that can trigger a hormonal change because the plant is trying to send seeds out for the next generation. So what happens is all of a sudden a stem starts growing up the middle and that stem is going to grow taller and taller and it might have a couple different leaves growing off of it. It's going to grow taller and taller and it grows flowers at the top which turn to seeds and the reason why it's tall, you can probably guess this, it's kind of weird but it makes sense. The reason why it grows so tall is it wants to spread its seed as far as possible and it's going to grow hundreds if not thousands of seeds and so it wants to get them up and so that the wind can take it and disperse it as wide as possible so it has the best chance of propagating to the next generation of plants. So whenever you see your greens grow really tall, bok choy does this too, very often. Uh, when you start to see the stem get taller and you start to see flowers on top, it's done. Your greens are not gonna produce any more greens. You might as well rip it out, enjoy it, eat it, and plant something else in the space. This is what I was referring to earlier in the video when I said why knowing plant biology is so important. If you don't rip it out and plant something else, then you're wasting that space because it's not gonna grow any bigger. It's actually the plant's gonna start dying and it's not gonna taste as good and it's gonna shrivel up, it's gonna turn colors. So you wanna eat it at that moment. If it's a green or a root vegetable and it starts to grow vertical and starts to flower, that's your moment to pull it out and enjoy it. All right, unless you're saving seeds. And that's fine. We're going to talk about seeds in just a minute here. Okay, so that's weird thing number four is these plants growing super tall. And then for fruiting plants like tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and all of those amazing, delicious, we call it fruiting even though they're vegetables. I know it's weird. What happens for fruiting plants at this point, now you want to produce the most amount of fruit possible. And right now with this hormonal change, your plants need new kinds of nutrition. So if you started the season off with a lot of good healthy soil and a lot of good nutrition in your soil, then you might be okay. If you added a couple inches of manure, composted manure at the start of the season, you might be okay. Um, if you added a lot of compost, you might be okay. But for some of the fruiting plants, you may need to add nutrients like more calcium, more magnesium, phosphorus and potassium. And there are blends that are available that you can add if you're seeing uh, your fruit not forming or your flowers dropping off or some of those things. Now other weird things that happen, your fruit falls off or your, your, um, your flowers fall off. This is another weird thing that can happen. So plants are very sensitive to temperatures. And so your tomatoes above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, what will often happen is that the flowers will start to fall off. And so you won't get those tomatoes. And so you wanna make sure that you're keeping your tomatoes under some shade cloth if you're getting up in the 100 degree temperatures in the summer. A little bit's not gonna make a difference. Here, we get really hot here in San Diego. And what we find is that up until now, uh, we've had great tomato production, but then we have a gap where the temperatures got really hot and some of the flowers fell off and no new tomatoes are forming. And then we have another spell of tomatoes afterwards. We could put up some shade cloth if we don't want those flowers to drop. Um, so another weird thing that plants do. And this is another thing to understand about plants is that I can't tell you everything you need to know about every plant. Just know that if your plant if is having flower dropping off or uh, fruit dropping off, a lot of times it's a temperature issue. Sometimes it's a nutrient issue. And then other times it's possible that you have a pollination issue. So you want to make sure you understand how your plants are pollinated when you have your, uh, your, your fruiting vegetables. So for instance, your tomatoes, these are self-pollinated is what they're called. And essentially what happens is just the wind, just the shaking of the wind will pollinate their own flowers. And so you can even grow tomatoes indoors and kind of shake them and they'll self-pollinate or even use a paintbrush and they'll self-pollinate. So those are that's self-pollinating. But then there are some plants like your squash plants that have male flowers and female flowers and the females have an ovary 
And so the pollen has to get from the male plant into the female plant in order for fruit to produce. And insects are the things that bring that pollen from the male to the female. And then there are some plants <clears throat> that wind pollinate. And this is like corn. This is why you plant 100 square feet of corn because the wind pollination between the plants is what allows you to get the, the, the harvest that you want. So I've seen people who, who grow a, a couple ears of corn and they don't get what they're looking for because there just wasn't quite enough for that wind pollination to happen. Their yield wasn't that as big as they hoped. And finally, you want to know what your pollination is because I found this out accidentally. So I used to grow kakuzi squash. And it's this beautiful squash. It's an Italian squash. And what I didn't realize is that <clears throat> it's night pollinated. And so in one place, bats were pollinating it for me. And then I moved and I was growing it. And I was like, why aren't I getting any squash? I have these all, the, all these beautiful flowers and no squash. And it was like, that's because there's no night pollinators here. So you want to understand how your plants are pollinated so that you get the maximum amount of fruit. And in this video, I can't go through every type of vegetable uh, in their reproductive state and how to know when it's ripe for harvest, all your cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, everything. Um, but what I will say is this, you want to understand for each vegetable that you grow, your variety that you're growing, you want to start to understand what it tastes like when it's ripe, because sometimes you want to pick your tomatoes at different points of ripeness and see what they taste like and say, okay, that's perfectly ripe and now I know. And so you get, you start to get an understanding. And so take, have a journal ready when you're ready for to do your taste tests and document, take a photo of it. This is what it looks like. Taste it and say, oh, it was a little bit tart or, oh my gosh, that was bursting with flavor. This is how I know when it's ripe is it's ex this exact color. So you might know by taste um, and that taste, and you might know by, t by the color associating that color with a taste, you might tell by touch. So with eggplant, there's a particular kind of squishiness of an eggplant where you know that it's ripe. If it's too hard, it's not gonna be ripe. And if it's too soft, it's, it's bad already. And then for color, every variety is a little bit different. So with tomatoes, you have, you have variations of colors, everything from green to pink to purple to red, to orange, every color of the rainbow on tomatoes and peppers. And so you really have to know the variety that you're growing and then watch the color evolve. And keep in mind that there are plants that you can be harvesting uh, at any time. Your greens, you could be harvesting at any time. Your herbs, you could be harvesting at any time. And also things like your uh, like I like tomatoes that are tart, so I sometimes pick them when they're underripe and I enjoy them when they're underripe. The same thing is true of, let's say, okra and summer squash. These are plants that actually taste really good when they're tender and young, and so you don't necessarily want to grow them to full size. You can pick them when they're small and enjoy them, and you don't have to necessarily wait for them to get to a certain size in order to harvest them. And while I'm on the topic of harvesting, this is one of my favorite topics because this is when you get to enjoy all of your hard work. You get to taste the deliciousness of your garden. This really is 40% of what you do in your garden. So it's worth taking a deep dive into harvesting. I could make multiple videos just about harvesting and how to get the most out of your garden. So a couple more pointers with harvesting. Uh, when you have plants that you want to cure, like your winter squashes, a couple of things, harvesting is everything in order to ensure that, that that butternut squash is going to remain in storage without rotting. So you wanna make sure that you cut the stem and keep the vegetable intact. And the way you know that it's ready for harvest is if you take your thumbnail and you press it in to the, the outside edge of that butternut squash and you can, if you can't put your fingernail into it, that means that the rind is hard enough. That means that that vegetable is going to be cured enough so that it can store. All right. So there's different ways of, uh, of understanding when your uh, vegetables are ripe and ready for harvest based on what you want to do with them. And a couple more tips about harvesting, because this is the best part of the journey, right? Is that plants, when you cut something off of a plant, it immediately starts dying. 
because it is separated now from all of its nutrition, all of its water, all its source of energy. It's, it's cut off from the earth. And so it starts to die a little bit each moment. And so one of the most important things that you want to understand about vegetables and herbs is if, you're, if you want maximum storage, what farmers do is they remove field heat. So what they do is they harvest in the early morning before it gets hot, sometimes as early as like 4 a.m. And they, they harvest early morning and then they plunge vegetables into cold baths to not only cool them down, but also to wash them, or they put them into cold storage immediately. And what that does is it stops the process of that plant dying and keeps it fresh longer. So with your garden, you don't have far to go from your garden to your table, and you might be enjoying that harvest at night, so it might not matter. But if you need to pick for maximum freshness, and let's say you wanna pick a lot of greens and you wanna keep them around for the week, I recommend putting them in vases on your dinner table in water, and what that will do is that will continue to keep them fresh, all right? And there are some vegetables I would recommend avoiding washing them for multiple reasons. So tomatoes, I wouldn't wash tomatoes unless you absolutely have to because the skin is so delicate you can break it open. So you don't really need to wash those tomatoes. And then with your okra, if you're ever growing okra, if you wash it, it gets kind of slimy. So I would recommend not, not washing okra if you can avoid it. And also your herbs, especially um, <clears throat> the herbs that can get kind of mushy with water, but most herbs have essential oils all over them. And so when you wash them, you're washing away some of that essentialness to it. So I would recommend not washing your herbs if you can avoid it, trying to harvest them uh, very cleanly so that you don't have to wash them. All right, so during the reproductive stage of your plants, for your, for your plants that are fruiting, you wanna keep them in this stage as long as possible so that they continue to fruit for you. But eventually what happens, the plant either gets old or the season comes to an end and the plant starts to move into what's called pod senescence stage. And this is where the seed pod starts to die off. And it's doing this for a reason. So specifically, let's talk about the difference between wet and dry seeds. So with a tomato, that is a wet seed. Um, it's inside of a wet fruit. And it's different than, let's say, a bean, which a bean is a less moist fruit. And as it dries up, the bean, you can hear it rattling if you shake the bean pod. So that's a dry seed versus a wet seed, which is in a tomato. And also dry seeds are things like herbs and, you know, cilantro, whatever. There's flowers that grow up and then those flowers at the base of them have seeds and they, come, they become dry and you just rub your hands on them and they, those seeds can just fall back into the soil. So there's a difference between wet and dry seeds and it has to do with is the fruit wet or not. So tomatoes are wet. Um, peppers, wet, those sorts of things, and then everything else is dry. So most seeds are dry. And what happens in the dry seeds is that the pod in which the, the seed is a part of, it dries up. Why does it do that? Well, it dries up to preserve it for the next season. So for a lot of places, gardens are an annual cycle. So essentially what's happening is the plant is saying, okay, it's the end of the season and I know what's gonna happen. We're gonna have cold temperatures in winter. I know it's not everywhere. I live in California, it's not so cold here in the winter. But what's gonna happen is there's gonna be some cold temperatures and there's gonna be some dry spells and what's, what I need is a seed that's gonna be completely dry so that it drops down into the soil and when the spring emerges and all that rain kicks into gear that it can sprout again. So that's what the plant knows, that's what the plant is planning for. So the seed pod starts to dry up to protect that seed so that that seed can be ready for the future, all right? And in this stage, all the energy is going towards the seed. So at this point, really, uh, if you have any greenery, if you're growing greens, this is not the time to think that this plant is gonna bounce back. It is done, 
it is done. All right, and when that pod is completely dry, now you have the seeds that are ready for the next generation. And here's the deal, because of, oh, hello honeybee, because most of what the plant is doing at this point is drying out that seed pod, if you want to, you can take that plant out of the ground and you can dry it elsewhere and that seed pod will dry out. And that gives you space to grow more food. And earlier today, or earlier in this video, I mentioned how this is what a lot of beginners get wrong, is they don't open up more space to plant more food. So this is your opportunity to plant more food, pull that plant out and dry it, hang it upside down somewhere. Or if you want to, uh, because it's not taking up mu more, very much energy of the garden, because all it's doing is drying out, is you can tie it to a stake. You can put a stake in the ground right where it is. Doesn't matter if you harm the roots at all, because the plant's really dying at this point put a stake in the ground and lift it up and tie it and let all of those seeds dry in place. That's another way you can do it. And by the way, when you do this later, let's say it's an herb like cilantro or parsley or dill and you want those seeds to, or fennel, I can see all my fennel behind me. Um, we allow that seed to just fall back to the earth and repopulate for the next season. You don't have to tie it to a stake if you don't need, if you don't have to. But what that does is it gives you more space in the garden. Here we like to do the fennel vertically because it shades out the rest of the garden in the heat. Okay, so the fifth and final stage is super simple. It's called stem senescence. This is where the stem starts to turn brown and dry up. This is game over, people. This is basically your plant saying, I can no longer deliver water and nutrients up this stem because the stem is dying. And so at this point, if you have decided that you're not going to be saving seeds and leaving it in the ground, you definitely want to get that plant out of the ground. There's no coming back from this. And this is something that I see happen for people in basil plants specifically. This happens very quickly as the plant will go up, it'll flower, the stem will turn brown. People will think the plant's going to come back. It's not going to come back. This is a moment to pull it out. Okay, so hopefully now you understand the life cycle of your vegetables from seed all the way back around to seed again, and what to expect during those different stages of growth, and what the plant is trying to communicate when it does some weird stuff. And speaking of weird, I want to end this presentation with wild, wonderful, and weird thing number five that vegetables and herbs can do. This is seed sprouting from the inside of a tomato. It's pretty crazy. Here's the deal though. Just because this happens doesn't mean that the plants that are grown from these seeds are going to produce good fruit. So even though something's weird and wonderful and you can enjoy it in your garden, it doesn't necessarily mean more yield. So there's always different ways to appreciate the life in your garden. Sometimes it's for the harvest and for the joy of the food. And sometimes it's just because it's weird and wonderful.